Thank you for coming. You all look magnificent. I'm going to say hello to Joshua in particular, who's just over there in a blue T-shirt, because we met yesterday and he was very nice to me. Um, you are magnificent. Thank you for coming to the Glance Festival and welcome to our panel of debut authors. Um, can I just ask if there are any aspiring writers in the audience? Can you just put your hands up? Don't listen to a word any of them say, because I've asked them for funny answers, not for useful answers tonight. Um, I'm going to make fun of them. I've encouraged sarcasm, our irony, poking fun at each other. Um, and entirely made up answers. So if anyone drops a good publishing tip, I might have a word with them afterwards. Um, they're also encouraged to plug their own books. And every time someone does drop in the title of their own book, if you could just cheer, that would be awesome. We'll make it like a, a talk bingo. Um, <laughs> not for this first bit though, because it's their jobs now to introduce themselves with their name and the name of their book really, really clearly. Do you want to start with John? Hi, uh, my name's John Wallace and my book's called Barricade. <laughs> okay. Thank uh, you. I am also John Horner Jacobs, and my book is called *The Incorruptibles*. We're getting the idea, yeah? Okay. And um, my name's Edward Cox, and my book's called *The Relic Guild*. <laughs> <laughs> and my name's Den Patrick, and my novel is called *The Boy with the Porcelain Blade*. <laughs> Okay, now they're going to be doing it on purpose, so stay on your toes. Um, I'm going to start with the first question, which is, what on earth prompted you to write? Was it a lack of social skills? Lack of friends? Would no one talk to you and you were trapped by yourself with a computer for nine hours, so you thought you might as well? Um, and I'm going to encourage you all, don't wait for me to ask you. Just jump in if someone says something funny and try and top it with something funnier. Ed, do you want to start? I started writing The Relic Guild. <laughs> Um, because there's nothing on earth like a good story. Mm. There you go. Okay. And I wanted to tell them. There's oh, the bar. Top that. <laughs> <laughs> to justify alcoholism. <laughs> <laughs> the bar's getting higher. John? Um, I, I, I just love sitting at home in my room, at home, lying up on the carpet, drawing <laughs> comics. It was brilliant. Yeah. You know you've written a book. We're here to talk about what was it? Oh, yeah, comics. Yeah. To this. I was going to say it was supposed to be made up, but then we went Barricating into comics. Yourself in your room. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Oh, very nice. Yeah. <laughs> very nice. I'll give you that one for free. Thank you very much. <laughs> I need it. Um, I wrote The Boy with the Porcelain Blade <laughs> because I was unemployed and couldn't afford the alcohol that John just spoke of. <laughs> <laughs> How's that panning out for you? Since I've got into publishing, it's a whole new different. A lot thing. more booze. Yeah. <laughs> Which is all, all actually, actually hung over from over last there. night. <laughs> <laughs> Second question. Um, this is the question I emailed them in advance. They've had time to think about it. How did you land an agent? Was it a bear trap, fishing rods, trail of cake, trail of booze, bribery by cupcake, or something else? Uh, John Wallace. Flattery. Simple. I mean, that's what, what else do you need? Yeah. <laughs> Or a real answer? Oh, well, you could, well, <laughs> if you want to sneak in a real answer, that would be fine. But yeah, yeah. Well, um, I, I got the agent for uh, Barricade. <laughs> still doing it. Um, oh, all the way through. We've got half an hour to go. A lot of cheering. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the really traditional way. Like I did Writers and Artists Yearbook, wrote the three chapters, did a synopsis, sent, posted it out absolutely everywhere that might be interested. <laughs> that's, what, that's how I actually did it. Okay, Dan? Um, so you, you don't want serious answers, do you? Well, at least I want one funny answer first. <laughs> at least one funny answer first. You see, and now I've built it up. It's not going to measure, is it? <laughs> um, so I left the manuscript for the boy with the porcelain blade <laughs> on the dining room table for a whole year, and every night I would put out two mince pies and a glass of milk. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the year, I had three things. I had lactose intolerance, <laughs> a weight problem, and a letter from Santa Claus telling me to cough. <laughs> Do you want to go for a serious one as well? No, not really. No? Fine. <laughs> Perfect. Well, in that case, Ed. Well, I stood in front of a mirror and said my agent's name three times backwards. <laughs> How does that sound? <laughs> <laughs> he won't let me tell you. <laughs> um, that was the psychic up uplink <coughs> right there, wasn't it? Check with agent. Agent says no. Move on. No, um, and the original version of the book, he said no. This is terrible. Go away and make it good. So I did, and then he took me on. That's the serious answer. And John, do you want to? Uh, my answer is both serious and true. Ooh, it, it was okay. uh, sort of. The is it funny? It's, 
strange. We'll see how we go. Um, it was from an internet flame war on a forum. And I actually ended up through the events on the board, I'm not gonna tell you about what they were, um, getting an agent. Your agent just, just dived in and was like, She you. wasn't there, but oh, was, she, okay. it, it ended with the introduction. Okay, so is that a top tip? Give, make arguments online. That, well, that's not, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well the next question I think is a really serious one. Um, has being published revolutionized your life? I mean, clearly you're here, but does it make a huge difference being here rather than in the front row because you would have pre-booked your tickets the instant they went up online? Uh, who, should I, who should I pick on? Sh um, Ed. Okay, Ed, here we go. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Can I, can Somebody's I, awake. Can I, can, I just, can I just say, that was shouted out by a lady called Heavy, Heather Iver at the back, and she's one of my ex Creative writing students. Oh, cool. Hello. And she is famous for having the biggest gob <laughs> in the <world. laughs> Well, you're going to have to answer the question now. Yes, I've forgotten what the question is, Julian. Has, <laughs> has being an author revolution, has being a Galantz author revolutionized your life? Yes and no. The first one was a much better answer than the second? Yes, it has, because it's a fantastic family to be with, and everybody has been well, wonderful for me, especially, you know, with, in the build-up to the release of The Relic Guild. <laughs> um, Whistling, too. But the strange situation that I'm in at the moment is that um, out of all of the Galantz debuts so far, I'm still the one who hasn't been officially published yet. So I'm still waiting to go. I'm still waiting for my turn. I've been watching these guys get in all the glory. <laughs> I know, I know, it's sad. And if you wanna... Oh, you can't keep your mouth shut, can you? Go on, what did you say? Man up. Man up, okay, I'm manning up. Next time, could you say pre-order? Those are really good words. <laughs> pre-order the Relic Guild. Which, actually, if you like downloading, is still on um, Amazon at the moment for £1.99 as a pre-order. Yeah, there's really good Wi-Fi connection here. Go for it. Go for it. Yes. Right now. <laughs> okay, um, who should we pick on next? John's looking at me. John, John Horner Jacobs is looking at me. So, has, it published, has, it, has being published revolutionized your life? Well, it got me here. That's a pretty big... Sorry. ...big sea change. And, um, yeah, um... A lot more time um, by myself staring at computer screens. So. so that's not lack of social skills or friends. It's now because we're making you do it. Pretty much. Does that make it more like hard work? Uh, yes, especially with Marcus starts yelling at me. Oh, uh, yeah. He's a tough taskmaster, is Marcus. Marcus. John Wallace. Yeah, um, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't in some ways, but it does in other ways. Um, it's, it's absolutely brilliant having... Like, but, because I had to wait like a year and a half, so then you wait for like nine months and absolutely nothing happens, and then suddenly there's the most enormous amount of stuff to do. Um, and, uh, and also, yeah, just reading people's like, opinions of your, of your book is a, big, is a big, big change. I mean, that is something. Um, because normally you've just been sat in, at home like scribbling away to yourself in a dark room, and now actually people are actually telling you what they think, and that's a hell of a thing, and that's, that's revolutionary. Yeah. Is that a scary thing? Are you on Google at two in the morning? Yeah, in some cases it's pretty scary. Um, yeah, and but in other places it's just it's brilliant and exciting and awesome. Yeah, it's um, it's a great thing. Fantastic. And Dan, you revolutionised. Mm. So since the publication of the Boy with the Porcelain Blade, <laughs> still got it. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, it, back in March. Uh, I have remained in my pyjamas until noon on every single day. <laughs> uh, I cannot state the importance of this uh, strongly enough. Um, revolutionised? So I think yeah. that's probably the main one, actually. Yeah. That, the yeah. pyjama thing is I the mean, main one. Pleased, obviously. Larger pyjama budget necessary if you go into the writing profession. Yeah, definitely. Pyjama bu uh, budget is actually pajama the name butt. of my... Is the Pajama name? Budget is okay. actually the name of my band. Does anyone else have any <laughs> band names? <laughs> and can you mind, can you mind we, we had a panel the other day where you were talking about your Western name. What is, what is your, your Western oh, cowboy name? Oh, right. Might what as well bring that in. Someone said it was Spontaneous Gravel. Yeah. <laughs> That's a nice one. I'd like a Western name. Well, if you were a cowboy, Ed, this is now the next question. If you were a cowboy, what would your name be? Everyone's going to have to think about this. Um, two, two Guns Teddy. <laughs> Author of the Relic Guild. Dan, cowboy name. Can you ask John? I, John, can I ask John? Yeah, I don't have a cowboy name. I've got, I've got a blues name. Your blues name? Well, Slim John Wallace. 
How about that? <laughs> Author of Barricade. <laughs> if you're going to make that claim, you'll have to stand up and do a twirl. Oh, n really? Really? I'm not no, kidding. No, no, I don't. Co oh, really? Come on. Yeah. I'm fairly, I'm fairly slim. Look at that. Round of applause for Slim. <laughs> slim John Wallace. That's pretty slim, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> Okay. I, never, I did not think I'd be doing a twirl tonight. <laughs> <laughs> this is how we revolutionise your life. <laughs> yes. Dan. I'm actually going to cheat and plug a book, a story that I wrote. I actually wrote a short Western story and it was called Red Hot Hate. And the, the, it's a play on the surname. So it's hate spelled H-A-I-G-H-T. So there you go. That's your cowboy name. Red You're going to be tough name. to call out in the bar. I just ooze hatred at all times. <laughs> <laughs> So I've got a question which actually is for my interest more than anyone else's, but um, what's it like working with an editor? And I said in my notes to them, by all this, play, play, play this for laughs. And in my note to me, I said, I really hope it's like being a piñata, which is evil of me. I like the idea of authors just being, feeling like they're bashed about a lot by their editors. Is, is my dream true or is it something a bit different to that? Well, my editor's sitting right there, so he could probably... <laughs> yeah, he can get you from that. He'd probably reach me with a punch from there. <laughs> So nice answers then. Um, yes, I'm going to play this straight. It's fantastic having the editorial process and working closely with, with an editor because the thing that's impressed me most about working with Galantz is that there's a lack of egos going on and it's all about the product, it's all about the work, it's all about making the story as good as it can be. Um, and then after Marcus it went on to the, um, the copy editor, Olivia Wood, who frightens the shit out of me, it has to be said. <laughs> she's she in here. here. She's, she, uh, she might be downstairs, you might have got no, away with that. No, she wouldn't be here to watch me. She'd be like massively <laughs> unimpressed. <laughs> or is she? Someone no, no, will come safe. flying out and hit me in a moment. Any, any minute now. Uh, who wants to go next on working with an editor? Anyone? Oh, Too scared, go on then. Um, so as an anecdote, uh, my editor had a problem with the bad guy in The Boy with the Porcelain Blade. Um, and got back to me with some, you know, maybe we can change this. And I kind of went through about two weeks of like thinking it over and losing some sleep, which I'm kind of good at anyway. Um, I think it's a prerequisite that most authors are insomniacs. Um, and after about two weeks, I just went back to him and I said, no. And he was like, okay. <laughs> and I was expecting this like protracted knockdown drag out like well I think it should be like this and well you know I did it for very good reasons and remember and he was just like no it's cool it's your name on the front knock your yourself problem. out <laughs> <laughs> so I spent two weeks staying up late worrying myself for absolutely no reason whatsoever and when it came to publication did any of the reviews comment on anything or was was yours the right decision did you have anyone saying wasn't sure about the bad guy or was was everyone's instinct right um, the only thing the reviews really said was it's a fantasy novel and then it, it changes gears and goes into horror. So if you like horror, buy The Boy, boy with the Plawson Blade. <laughs> uh, John Horner Jacobs, how is it working with. I, I'm aware that, again, your editor's in the front row, so you could get clobbered. But how is it working with an editor? It's a so safe space, you can tell everyone. So, uh, yeah, there's times, um, well, since I'm an American, uh, there, there are these moments where people are talking to me and I just sort of can't understand exactly what they're saying. Mm -hmm. No, you're, you're, you're just, you're just going to have to figure it out. Yeah. The Incorruptibles. Yay. Yay. What's it like working with an editor? Working with Marcus? Oh, I have to answer. Yeah, you have to answer. Oh, um, <laughs> it's a, a hellish, slavish relationship. And that's like on his end. Um, it's great. It's wonderful. He's, he's, he's lovely to work with. Yeah. Mr. Wallace, it's up to you to make my, my nightmare piñata story come true. No, I mean, Simon's no. not here, so I could... Um, I don't think he's here, anyway. I mean, I could say all sorts of things, but actually, he's just really, really lovely, and I have, I have the constant urge to hug him. I really do. <laughs> anyone who comes down and tells you that... I remember the first uh, meeting we had, he came down, and, um, and when, he d when someone who's read your book like, talks to you about the characters and what they liked about the characters and what they liked about the book, I just desperately wanted to hug him. Um, but I re restrain myself, whereas Ed is a very big hugger no. and just hugs everyone all the time. Never, ever met a hugger, did me, Mike. was telling me yesterday that he actually <laughs> had an embarrassing standing up on tiptoe hug with Simon only the other day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like Which nearly back. turned into huge. something. Yeah, he is really, really huge. But I had this kind of really weird moment where I sort of turned into somebody from like a bad 70s sitcom or something. I was actually in Gillian's office at the Galantz Towers. That makes it sound very grand. 
yes, and huge, huge palatial office. Um, and I was talking to Gillian, and Simon walked in, and I do hug everybody as a matter of course. And hugger. I turned around to, to hug Simon, and he's so tall, I had to go up on tiptoes. And I looked at Gillian, and I went, oh, I've got to go on tiptoes for this one. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> maybe I should get some editors up here and ask how it is working with authors, because maybe we've got funniest stories. <laughs> this midget came along and hugged me. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Actually, while I'm embarrassing authors, because I was given a microphone, I'm going to really freak an author out. Um, if everyone in the room could just turn around and look at the back corner, we've got an author called Tom Toner, who's going to put his hand above his head and wave at you all. He's one of our debuts for next year. He was safe. Sorry, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, my next question is a really boring one. Um, is there anything that really surprised you as an author, beyond being hugged by Ed, or unexpectedly being singled out to an audience of 130 people having snuck in at the back? What was the original question? <laughs> what surprised you? What surprised what me? What surprised you? <clears throat> um, okay, shall I I'll go first? Um, do you know, it, it, this, is, this is a strange one. For, for a long time, I was hiding away, for at least 10 years, maybe 15 years. I was hiding away in my office, kind of telling stories, writing stuff down, and sending them off to very, 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 very small places in America to get published, you know, I'm talking places that on the very periphery of the publishing industry. And I always felt like I was safe there, that it was a good place. Yeah. And when I got to the stage where I thought, well, now I've got this big story, maybe it's time to stand up and be counted for it and see if there's anybody in this country, maybe a major publisher. When that door was opened and I walked through and I said, yes, we want your book. I don't know what I was expecting, maybe Dragon's Den or something like that, and maybe I'd fallen out of love with my own country or the publishing industry in my own country. But that was the biggest surprise to me was how special and welcoming I was made to feel when I walked through that door. And I never want to leave. <laughs> Does that mean we will never get you out? <coughs> never. never. That's it. Never. The, the relic girl. <laughs> uh, John Wallace, anything that surprised you? Um, it surprised me how long the, the joy of it all has lasted. I'm just, it's so happy, it just makes me feel so happy still just to be like a published author and to like be all these guys. I know that sounds a bit cheesy, but it, it genuinely does. It's such a thrill to be able to say like, oh, I'm an author. Because my, my wife always used to say, when people used to ask me what I did, I used to go like, oh, I'm, I'm a communications officer for this charity. Um, and my wife used to say, why don't you ever say you're a writer? That's what you are, you're a writer. I go, no, I'm not, no, I'm not a writer. <laughs> but now I can, actually, uh, I can actually say it, and it feels great. <laughs> okay, who wants to go next? Uh, a, a, a very weird thing for me is that my daughters try, they really, really want to read my books. And, you know, I'm, because there's some adult content in the in Incorruptibles, and... I'm always, I'm always, thank you, uh, I'm always sort of like, you know, keeping track of all the copies in my house just to make sure that, you know, they haven't really got in there and snuck off and started, you know, pawing through it, which I totally would have known. So the main thing that I've noticed since the publication of The Boy with the Porcelain Blade <laughs> is that um, other writers now approach me for advice as if I know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> and I can assure you, I really, really don't. Um, I I've come to you for advice. <laughs> <laughs> Sucker. <laughs> um, I, I, um, I've sort of uh, really enjoyed the process of going to book two, and I think I really grew through that. And I've just started the second draft of book three, and every time you, you try a new project, you know, hopefully you grow a bit and you try and push yourself to do something new, but I am always fascinated when people approach me and ask me for advice. Uh, I don't understand why they do that either. No, I, <laughs> well, you've read it. So. <laughs> Steady. Okay, we've, got, we've got five minutes left, so I am going to ask each of our authors to give their best, funniest, or worst convention experience, because this is kind of a mini convention. So, But to give them a few minutes to think about it, I'm going to give my first uh, my best, funniest convention experience, just while they think. Um, and 
This one actually happened at Nine Worlds. We'd had an event a bit like this, lots of people in, and we'd had some music running in the background. And at the end of the party, everybody left. So we could shut the doors and we could fish out the bottle of wine we'd hidden. And uh, the playlist was still going, and uh, the song that came up was the Macarena. Oh, shit. So there were, you know, <laughs> maybe 12 of us in, 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 in the room, one of whom is uh, choosing not to make himself known. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, uh, yeah, we, we might have spent some very, very happy time uh, just sort of in the room by ourselves after the event. Everyone's a bit more chilled out. Dancing the Macarena, and it was absolutely awesome. <laughs> so it wasn't, it wasn't readers. It, wasn't, it, was, it was just that all of us together having a really great time, uh, doing something kind of silly, um, and really, really enjoying it, which is kind of what events should be and what I hope all of you get from this event. So... I, I have no mind. Okay. Right, right off the top. Um, so I have... Uh, in the States, I have a sort of post-apocalyptic book out, and um, I went to a convention to promote it, and it, it was a, a film a fan fest, so it had a large film track, and all the Walking Dead, the, the, the actors from The Walking Dead were there, so there was millions of people either cosplaying zombies, like, zo like gooey, ooey gooey zombies with like contacts that were, like if you got in the elevator with them, it was really uncomfortable. <laughs> um, but the hotel that it was at was a huge, sprawling, sort of hot place in Louisville. And they had scheduled a wedding at the same time. <laughs> and uh, so th this, there was this whole wedding party. And the, the look on the, sort of the, the, the bride and the bridesmaid's faces when, when yes. uh, like zombies sort of tottered through <laughs> was, was, I mean, I, I shouldn't have been so gleeful about the whole thing. <laughs> But it was, it was wonderful. Okay, uh, Ed, you're making eye contact. Yes. Um, last year at World Fantasy Con at Brighton, um, very great thing happened to me, F funny thing happened to me. I, I was just about a week before the convention, I'd been doing these stupid, crappy comic things. And I, it, they were called Edward Meets. And it was about what I would do if I met my favorite authors, my heroes. And I did one for Neil Gaiman. Um, and I tweeted it. And I thought, I know, I'll be cheeky. I'll tag Neil Gaiman's name into it. So I did. And Neil Gaiman retweeted it <laughs> 20 seconds later. And the amount of retweets and the favorites just imploded my computer. So anyway, a week later, I'm, I'm at um, World Fantasy Con. And I'm at one of the parties. And Marcus, my editor, comes over to me and says, Ed, there's somebody I want you to meet, because he knows I'm a huge Neil Gaiman nut. And he took me across the room and plunked me down in front of Neil Gaiman. So instantly I had to resist the urge to start mooing at him or something like that. It's, you know, and, but... Well, you laugh, but it's easily done. <laughs> but then um, Marcus said to him, Neil, this is Ed, and explained who I was, and he wrote this comic for you that you retweeted the other day. And he, and he remembered it. And then Marcus had the bright idea and said, would you like to reenact it with Ed now? <laughs> By this time, I'm sort of, I'm face down on the floor, it's Neil Gaiman. Um, so yeah, so we reenacted it, only the embarrassing thing about it was is that he actually remembered his lines, but I forgot all of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the kind of good moment, that was a great moment. Okay, who's next? I don't think I have an embarrassing story, oh, but um. I do have, uh, also from World Fantasy Con, but on the Sunday night, and um, I was very kindly invited out to dinner by Galantz, and I sat down at the table and found myself sat next to uh, Patrick the office and on the other side of him was uh, Scott Lynch. <laughs> and this was before the publication of The Boy with the Porcelain Blade. <laughs> so, um, and it was just, I had complete imposter syndrome. I was just sat there and they were just, you know, chatting away about Quoth and Loch Lamora. And I was like, what am I doing here? This is <laughs> uh, so I did the only thing I could do and I ate a lot of, uh, Barbecue, was it? Yeah, Something well, like that, yeah. yeah. A lot of Brazilian steak. A lot of Brazilian steak, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, Im imposter syndrome. But I, unfortunately, I didn't have to recite any lines to Neil Gaiman. Oh, I, I didn't. I just mooed at him. <laughs> Don, no pressure. Last story. I had, um, it's not a convention thing, but it was at the Orion uh, party, actually. After, uh, there was a sort of big Orion party, and then afterwards, we were, a lot of us went back to the pub. And um, I'm not very good at like circulating at these. It was a huge barn of a place by hundreds of people there, 
Um, and afterwards, I was sort of saying to my agent, um, like, oh, oh, I didn't get to meet um, Adam Roberts. I, I saw him there, and I really wanted to say hi, but I don't know, I just didn't feel like I could just get there. Anyway, my agent, who had perhaps a few drinks, <laughs> said, uh, don't worry, I'll go and get them for you. <laughs> so he disappeared, and for a really long time. <laughs> and then for about an hour later, he came back with this guy. But it wasn't Adam Roberts. <laughs> And I was talking to this guy and I was chatting away with him. I go, oh, this is fun, this is great, this is, this is all good. But I thought, I don't, I don't know who this bloke is. So eventually I just had to ask, um, sorry, uh, what's, what's your name? And he said, oh, I'm Alistair Reynolds. I went, that's oh, it's Reynolds. <laughs> I did make that sort of very high-pitched noise as well. It was really embarrassing. But it was, and he was just lovely as well. So I've still got to meet Adam. Um, but well, Adam is downstairs. I'll get him for you in a minute. Thanks. <laughs> How long will that take? <laughs> Actually, Adam and Al Reynolds are downstairs, so you can see them later if you want. And Patrick Rothfuss is on the floor. So I'd like each of our authors to give their name and their title again. And if you give them a really big cheer, because they've been fab. And once you give them all a really big cheer, we'd like a big round of applause for you, because you've been fabulous. So do you want to start with John and work our way back down? Oh, what am I saying? Yeah, name, your name and, and book title. John Wallace Barricade. <laughs> I'm Dean Patrick, and <laughs> the boy with porcelain blade. <laughs> I'm John Horner Jacobs, the Incorruptibles. <laughs> so I'm Ed Cox, <laughs> and I wrote the Relic Guild. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.